Hey everybody, welcome back to The Nerdy Pastor. Pastor Ross Turner here. I um, wanted to bring to your attention a book that I have recommended a number of times since it was uh, republished and uh, brought a new introduction to the book uh, back in 2019. It is uh, Herman Bovink's The Wonderful Works of God. And I promoted this book a number of times on my channel in our my top 10 one volume lists and some other um, recommendations as well uh, of Bob Inc. Um, but I, I never really have done a, a review of the book. And I'm taking a, a group right now in my church, a reading group right now uh, through this book uh, this summer. And uh, just wanted to, to offer up some of the highlights, I think, of the book and, and encourage you to consider getting this uh, for your own personal library, for your own study and your own edification. And again, um, systematic theology books um, are becoming ever popular again. Uh, really, I would say probably since the 1980s, it seems like, at least in evangelical circles, always been around, but really becoming very popular again, um, which is wonderful in a lot of ways because the Christian faith um, is uh, is just that. It's an, it's an objective faith. Um, it's, a, it's a galaxy of doctrines put together, but also unveiled in, in story form and history. Uh, which is uh, what I think Bavink captures so well in this one volume. And as the book uh, very clearly states, it's not really a um, um, some kind of just um, a watering down of his four volumes. And I think, you know, way, way up there, I've got that four volume of his and many other works of his too. But essentially, it's not a, an abridgment of that. It's not a, a, a watering down of that. It's not uh, that kind of... Um, that kind of writing. It's really something that is, is uh, robust, but yet unique um, in that it's, it's meant to be written at a more popular level, but doesn't skimp on the truth and the challenge of and the beauty of the Christian faith um, at all. I mean, I, I think it's so close to being as good as, as Calvin. Calvin's one volume uh, for me that, that, it, that it's hard to, hard to call it second place, even though I have and I still maintain that uh, for, for a couple reasons. But Bavink is, um, the, the benefits of Bavink are one, this was written in 1909. Again, most people remember this book you know, being published for a long time um, in the 50s and on as um, Our Reasonable Faith, which what a, what a wonderful title to that book. But I think this book uh, title captures it better, The Wonderful Works of God, um, which is so beautiful because it really kind of captures the, the momentousness of the divine acts in history, and it reminds me of John chapter 5, um, though Jesus doesn't talk about Exodus and doesn't talk about creation and other things. He he speaks about the, the monumental great works, the works that you've seen, which is his miracles, the works you, you will see, which is um, the crucifixion and the resurrection, and the work you finally will see, which is the great return, the, the final day of judgment, you know, so... Uh, uh, John 5, 7, uh, 19 through 29 there. So yeah, this book captures that. There's just kind of these monumental peaks that he captures. And the benefits of Bavink, I think, is that he captures, as the title says, the great redemptive works of God in history. And that's just something I think that's really helpful for us to consider as we think of systematic theology or or the faith of Christianity kind of put together, clustered together, the galaxy of doctrines uh, put together in story form. And in our discussion this morning with our group, uh, uh, one of the men said that that's what he really appreciated so much about our discussion this morning on chapter 14, the covenant of grace, that that he doesn't just talk about the doctrine of election as if it's some kind of, you know, kind of just eternal principle. Um, it, it, it is, but it's also set in relationship to God's unfolding plan of redemption in history. And that is, again, something he's really gifted at doing, which is in in you know, academia or in a little bit more of a uh, disciplinary way, we would say he knows how to marry systematic theology and biblical theology together like the Bible does. The Bible uh, is a, is written in story progressive form, but yet it unveils the doctrines of this story more and more and more, of course, and they all become yes and amen ultimately in Jesus Christ um, in, in, in every way, shape, and form. There's a connection point. To Jesus Christ. However, it's unveiled. It's a story of, re of redemption. It's not just redemption defined. It's also, as as uh, the great theologian John Murray says, it's redemption applied. It's not just a, a, a covenant, but it's a covenant 
history, a covenant of redemption. It's a story of redemption. And Boffing, I think, captures that so well in this book, which is really important for you if you're going to want to learn biblical theology well, too, not just systematic categories or truths. So I think that's one of the, the major strengths of this book that a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of evangelical theology does not capture very well. And I'm not going to name names, but I'm simply going to tell you they don't typically capture that drama and the story very well, and they, it kind of just makes it seem like a bunch of esoteric loci that are disconnected in some sense from life. So we, we want to avoid that because the Bible doesn't present truth in that way. It's truth that's unchanging, but yet it's unveiled um, progressively in a story um, that becomes brighter and brighter and brighter, as John Calvin says, of providence. So that's one of the benefits. I think the second benefit is that it's been it was written not not but a hundred and I guess 113, 14 years ago. So it's very modern. Um, even for being 114 years old, it's a very modern textbook. There's a lot of <laughs> recent theology sometimes that, that sounds like it's not from the 20th century to 21st century. It sounds really dated. Bovink is not like that. Bovink really engages the modernist mindset. And I know that for, for many people, we're in a postmodern mindset now, but in many ways, it's still very modernist out there. So there's a modernist mindset that he engages richly. I mean, he talks so often about the pluralism of society. He speaks so often about the Islamic um, um, uh, religion uh, so often. He talks so much about um, the Enlightenment influence and, of course, all the kind of paganistic ideologies that come out of the 19th and, and late 20th century, um, such as transcendentalism and things like that. He always brings in the secularist and the paganistic and, and the world religions into his conversation, which is, you know, a sign of his, his modernity, you know. So it, it's really important uh, for us as Christians now to think in that context because if we only read the Puritans, as, as incredible as they are, and as much as I love them, got my new set of uh, Thomas Boston's 12 volume here, we'll be doing some com comments on that soon. But there, there's a sense there of, of we're, we're out of touch. In fact, my sermon this this coming Sunday is going to talk a little bit about we're out of touch. Not that we we don't have truth, we do, but we we're out of touch in how to present it. Um, when we don't understand what's going on in some sense out in the culture and the questions that they are asking, and, you know, are we answering the questions they are asking? Or are we just giving them an answer to a question that they're not posing to us? So Bobbing helps us, I think, grounds us better in our current situation. Uh, without removing us from the timelessness of Christianity in any sense. So he just does a masterful job of marrying the timeliness of Christianity and the timelessness of Christianity together in this book. And then he marries systematic theology and biblical theology so beautifully together. Like in the covenant of grace he's speaking about today, he speaks about the doctrine of election, of course, as the root of the covenant of grace. And then he says in this brilliant little moment, he says, as he has so many, he says, the covenant of grace would no longer be a covenant of grace without election. It would become a covenant of works. Woo! What a powerful statement there. Showing again the relationship of systematic theology of the truths of the Bible, yet in relationship to the wisdom and plan of God for his world and for his people. So, Bavink is just really gifted, so gifted at marrying all these disciplines together. Disciplines of apologetics and disciplines of cultural apologetics wedded together to uh, pastoral theology in many ways, or systematics and biblical theology, the, the, the divine truths to the divine story together. So he just does a masterful job of this. And I think lastly is he is, he is able to condense great challenging arguments or great challenging conversations in very small spaces, the economy of words is incredible. It's still 550 pages, but that he is able to say as much as he does in as little space as he does is just stupendous. It is just incredible. Now, I'm not against long-winded people. Um, I'm a little long-winded myself. The reality is most pastors are. <laughs> it's just the truth, you know? You know, and so, you know, you think of, again, Thomas Boston. He's got 12 volumes of his works, and... Most of them are sermons. You know, there's a sense of we can say a whole lot. 
there's there's a time for that, I think, sometimes to elaborate. You know, Puritans are known for their uh, their what's called branching. They, they keep talking about something and talking about something and talking about something, you know, and sometimes that might wear on you. But for me, it, it, it's it's a rich way of speaking more thoroughly about things and from different angles. So there's a, a benefit and a drawback there. I think the benefit for Bavink is the economy of words are so um, are so economic in how he chooses and argues and succinctly puts together these things, you will be able to see and grasp a lot at once. I would say the small drawback is there is sometimes a lack of thoroughness. Even in the reading of our, our group today, there wasn't a whole lot on the different covenants in the covenant of grace. It wasn't a whole lot of talk. Just they just he just noted the individual heads of those covenants. You know, um, Abraham and Moses and Noah and David. Very quickly, Jesus and he just real quickly um, um, brings them out. So there, there's there's a little bit sometimes of a lack of thoroughness when there needs to be probably more time taken. But that's the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book is to serve as a really reliable guide and introduction to every one of the great categories of Christian thinking and doctrine. But yet biblical storyline in revelation i think those three things you know essentially the 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 economy of words the way he marries i think biblical and systematic theology and also the way that he engages i think the pluralism and secularism and relativism he spends so much time on um, evolution um, and, and it's as if someone was writing today. So I think you're going to find this book to be absolutely uh, amazing in its effectiveness for what it is accomplishing in so little space comparatively to other works. Um, it's number two so close to Calvin. It's so close um, in, in its effectiveness of the one volume. And I'm talking about the 1541 French edition translated uh, by Robert White, 2014, the English edition. Um, it's been in publication, obviously, since 1541 in a French, but the English translation is so helpful and so wonderful. I still find that one to be the, the, the warmest and the richest, more devotional that I appreciate. But there are drawbacks of that because of the, of the, of the, the, the chronology, how, how old it is. But I still enjoy it a little bit more. Um, but Bob, I think, is so close as number two, and then it's a pretty big drop-off after that. So I pray that this would be an encouragement for you to go get this book. You know, I think it's 30 bucks or $20, $28 on most sites. It is worth it, folks. I think as Christians, we, we owe it to ourselves to have a better grasp on what Christianity is, not just what it means to be a Christian personally, but actually what Christianity is. And I think I find more and more as, as I pastor in churches that there is a, a real weakness on understanding what Christianity is. We, we understand maybe what it means to be a Christian on a personal level to some, to some level we understand that, but we really don't understand the bigger picture very well. We don't understand the objectivity of our faith. Um, we, there's always a danger to becoming overly subjective and overly personal and you know, overly existential. You know, it's about kind of what's going on with me um, here. So I, as important as it is to be a Christian, to become a Christian, and to live like one, it's also important to know how a Christian fits into Christianity, okay? And this book will go a long way. To helping you there. If you're not used to reading books like this, it'll challenge you, but you got to start, you know, somewhere. And what better place to start than one of the best places to go? So I would, I would encourage you really go out and get this book, The Wonderful Works of God by Herman Bovink, and dig into it. Read, it's like 20 or 25 pages on most chapters. Some of them are 10 or 15, and you can read, you know, a little bit each day and you'll get through it in a few months. Um, you know, maybe even less than that, depending on how much you, you read each day. Our group is taking about 40 pages a week, and we're going to do it in 16 weeks. And there you go. I mean, you have four months, and you read a, one of the best books out there. So I encourage you, go get this book. And once you get this book by Bovink, then maybe it'll inspire you to get some of his other works, in, including just had published um, Christian Worldview a couple years ago, which is a fantastic book. Fantastic. Much more academic, though, than this book. Of course, his two volumes on Christian Reformed Ethics, his four volume, uh, Reform Dogmatics, way up there, yeah. And then a bunch of other books on Christian Revelation, Revelation, Philosophy of Revelation. He's got a book on the Christian family that came out. There's other monographs that are coming out that are being published even now by Crossway, is where you can find most of them. So I encourage you, jump into this volume and maybe it'll branch out for you in other places, but really read this and have this in your library at home. All right, signing off.